Okay, welcome back. We're going to wrap up our nuclear chemistry chapter today. And as promised, we're going to have a discussion about nuclear fission. Uh, nuclear fission, as you may already know, is a process whereby the atom is split. And in the process, a tremendous amount of energy can be gained from, um, from doing so. For example, we had said earlier about 80 million kilojoules of energy is given off for every kilogram of fissionable uranium, which is uranium-235, that can react. And that's equivalent to about 30,000 kilograms of, of TNT, which, uh, boy, is about 30, 30 or so tons of TNT. So a tremendous amount of energy for a very small mass. And you guys may be aware of this equation. It's uh, made famous by Einstein. Said E equals delta M C squared. That delta M is the change in mass. So a very small change in mass when multiplied by the velocity of light squared ends up in a, a quite a large yield of energy. Now, what happens? Well, uranium-235 is the only naturally occurring fissionable element. Uh, there are other elements that are fissionable, but they're all synthetic. They're man-made. Now, the nucleus, as you can imagine, of uranium-235 is unstable. Now, if a neutron is shot and it hits that nucleus in just the proper orientation at just the proper velocity, it can cause a disruption in that nucleus, so much so that the nucleus splits into two smaller nuclei. Now, when that happens, there's a tiny change in mass, and that mass is converted to energy. Now, along with two lighter nuclei that are produced, additional neutrons are made. In this particular collision, we get the two lighter nuclei and we get three more neutrons. Now, what can those three neutrons potentially do? Well, potentially, they could strike three more uranium-235 nuclei, and they could cause them to split, each time releasing three more neutrons. And, of course, you can see what would happen. We end up with, with what's known as a chain reaction. So in this particular instance, a neutron moving at just the right speed strikes the nucleus of a uranium-235 atom. It splits it into two lighter nuclei, krypton-91 and barium-142, and three neutrons are produced. Now, if there are other uranium-235 nuclei around, they can then split those up to three in this case, which, of course, are going to produce each time those two lighter nuclei and three more neutrons. And those three neutrons can then uh, split another uranium-235 atom, and the process gets exponentially larger. Now, there's a concept called critical mass that's talked about in your textbook. And that's simply the minimal amount of fissionable material that's necessary to sustain this chain reaction. For instance, along with uranium-235, there might be some uranium-238 in the sample, which is by far and away the more abundant of the uranium isotopes. If a neutron were to slam into a uranium-238 atom, nothing would happen. A fission process would not occur. So there has to be um, a minimal amount of uranium-235 that's present in order to sustain that chain reaction. Now. Um, let's just write this reaction off to the side so you guys can get a feel for what's happening. So once again, we have uranium-235, that's its mass number, atomic number 92. And of course, we are going to slam into it with a neutron. In the process, we're going to split that uranium-235 atom, as you can see, into krypton and into barium. Now, the krypton isotope has a mass of 91, and krypton has 36 protons. The barium has a mass of 142, and it has 56 protons. So you can see on the bottom, 36 plus 56 gives me the atomic number or a number of protons of 92, which balances on both sides of this nuclear equation. However, the mass number, 91 plus 142, gives me a total of 233. Well, on this side, I have 235 plus 1 for 236, so my mass is 3 units short. And that's where we end up with the 3 neutrons that are produced. And so, like we said, those 
three neutrons that are produced can then go ahead and they can split additional uranium-235 atoms if the critical mass is present. If not, the reaction can fizzle. Now, in atomic bombs, the critical mass turns out to be about 90 or higher percent of fissionable material. In nuclear power plants, the percentage is much, much smaller than that, less than 10% from what I've read. So nuclear power plants cannot blow up like atomic bombs. There's just simply not enough fissionable material. Now I'm going to make this picture a bit bigger for you, so it's a little easier to see on our video. It's a very simplistic diagram of a nuclear power plant, and it's a not, a, not a whole lot different than a coal-fired power plant. The objective is to heat up water and to cause that water to turn to steam. That steam is pressurized and directed at a, at a turbine. Now a turbine, you can imagine, is a pinwheel. When you were a little kid, you could blow on a pinwheel and you'd make it spin around. Well, a turbine something like that. Except we're using pressurized steam to spin that turbine. And as that turbine spins, and that provides the energy to operate an electrical generator, which of course generates electricity. Now after that steam is used, we'd like to reuse it. So we're going to cool it. Now the cooling process, of course, um, will condense that steam back into liquid water and that can be placed in the steam generator where the process can repeat itself. So oftentimes nuclear power plants are built by large bodies of water where cool water can be pumped into this condensing area and cool that steam down. Now if they're not near large bodies of water you might often see large condensing towers um, which are um, quite familiar when you see, if you've ever seen The Simpsons, you'll see a structure that looks like something like this. And you'll see steam rising out of the top. And it operates on, similar to a car's radiator. The steam moves through here and air moves through here. It can condense that steam inside so it can be uh, liquefied and placed back in our steam generator. Now, of course, the nuclear reactions providing the heat to turn that liquid water into steam. So inside our reactor core, we have a series of fuel rods and control rods. Now the fuel rods, of course, are made out of fissionable material. Let's just say uranium-235 for right now. The control rods are made out of a substance that can control, that can absorb neutrons. Barium is really good, or cadmium is very good at absorbing neutrons. So as those control rods are lowered between the fuel rods, if they absorb the neutrons, let's flash back to the previous page really quick. If they absorb these neutrons here, you can see that they can no longer participate in the chain reaction and they can slow down or stop the reaction. So control rods are essential in obviously controlling the fission reactions that occur. The control rods are placed beneath the fuel rod, or between the fuel rods. Critical mass is not achieved, and the reaction can stop. Now, coal-fired power plants aren't much different. Well, I shouldn't say not much difference, relatively speaking. The big difference is the source of heat. In coal-fired power plants, obviously, coal is being used, or maybe natural gas is being used to produce that heat. And of course, along with that, there are pollutants and carbon dioxide. Considerable amounts are placed into the atmosphere, with some people, which some people feel contributes to the greenhouse effect and global warming. Nuclear reactors, on the other hand, do not produce any type of those greenhouse gases. However, once these fuel rods are used, we end up with some nuclear waste. These isotopes that are made during the fission process may be radioactive, and they may be radioactively hot for a number of years. Of course, they're not fissionable, so they need to be removed from the reactor, and they need to be stored somewhere for a long period of time. And that's the trouble with nuclear power plants, is where do we store that radioactive waste? Currently, all of that waste needs to be stored on site where the power is generated. But there is some legislation to move the nuclear waste, I believe, somewhere in Nevada, in Yucca Mountain. And you can read about that at your leisure. At any rate, um, nuclear power plants, once again, uh, inside the reactor core, have um, uranium. In this case, we're saying uranium-235. And we said the control rods are good at absorbing neutrons, which can stop that 
chain reaction. So we have incoming cool water and it gets heated. It's very hot water and that can actually operate the steam generator which can cause the liquid in the steam generator to evaporate. We can pressurize that and spin that turbine. So that's the basics, the very simplistic view of how nuclear power plants work. I thought I'd wrap this up with a few multiple choice questions. A few problems that maybe we can work together that might help you on your homework or other assignments. So let's just take a look and see how much we've learned in this unit. Um, let's take a look at iodine-131. If it's a beta emitter, what other particle is produced? So recall we have iodine, mass number 131, and we're saying it gives off a beta particle. Remember that's our symbol for a beta particle. What other particle is produced? Well, first, let's look at the atomic number for iodine. We will need to know that. So, if we look on our periodic table, I have one right over here. I'll just look it up for you quickly. Iodine's atomic number is 53. So, if it gives off a beta particle, what is this other particle? So let's see, we know the mass number remains unchanged, so the mass of the new particle will be 131 still. So we can cross off antimony 127 and iodine 130 because we know the mass needs to be 131. So let's see, what happens to the atomic number? Well, remember, the atomic numbers need to balance. So if I have 53 on this side, negative 1 plus 54 will give me 53 on the right-hand side. And atomic number 54 is xenon. So we'll make an isotope of xenon, xenon-131. And that's why we will choose letter A. Well, let's take a look at number two. Number two is a half-life problem. So iodine-131 again has a half-life of eight days. What percentage of the sample would remain after 24 days? Well, let's see, if we begin with 100% after one half-life, or eight days, wouldn't I have 50% remaining? Okay. After another eight days, how much would I have left? Don't say 0%. It would be half of 50%, which is 25%. So that's a total of 16 days so far. Now we have to go for 24 days. So that's one more half-life of eight days. And that would give us 12.5% that would remain. So my answer would be letter D for number two. Let's take a look at number three. This is interesting. We have the decay of thorium-232. It has one alpha decay and then two beta decays. What is the result of these decays? So if we start with thorium-232, the atomic number of thorium is 90. It involves an alpha decay, so let's kick off an alpha particle. The other particle have an atomic number of 88 and a mass of 228. The atomic number 88 ends up being radium. Okay, so that's after my alpha decay. So now we have two beta decays. So 0 over negative 1e would be one beta decay. And that would have an atomic number of 89 and a mass of 228 still. Atomic number 89 is actinium. Okay, so that's after my um, first beta decay, but this says two beta decays. So now this has to go through one more beta decay, and so we'd end up with an atomic number of 90, which is the element thorium again, and the mass would be 228. So I'm going to look for thorium 228 as my answer, and it looks like letter A would be correct. And one more problem just for fun. Here's one more nuclear equation. You can see that's an alpha particle that's emitted. What is the other nucleus here? Well, we have 238 on the left-hand side. 4 plus 234 would be letter A. So I think I can cross off these two, can't I? And the atomic number, let's see, 2 plus what is 92? Well, I think that's 90, right? So I can cross off that. So it looks like the letter Z is equal to 90, and the letter A is equal to 234, so we're going to go with letter D. Okay, so there's a little bit of help on 
some homework problems for you. Hope you guys enjoyed this chapter. We really have just scratched the surface. There's much more to learn. But we'll wrap it up there. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Have a great day.